Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is Brian Tokiyoshi. I work on the product team for Global Protect and Global Protect Cloud Service. And I'm based out of headquarters, so I'm um, happy to share this op opportunity to give you a little bit more background on Global Protect. Now, today, specifically, we're going to be covering Global Protect Cloud Service more so than Global Protect that you use on your existing firewalls. And that's because that a lot of people that are using Global Protect, you, they, a lot of people know Global Protect on the firewall. How many of you are already using it? Oh, we got half the room. But what you'll find is that Global Protect Cloud Service shares a lot of the same common elements so that even as we go through, I won't have enough time to go through the demo, but I'll be doing a demo later on in the afternoon in the expo hall. But from there, you'll see that a lot of the things that are in Global Protect, the subscription, are very similar in Global Protect Cloud Service. What you'll find is primarily the difference is that when you think about this, what Global Protect Cloud Service really does is that it brings the technology of Global Protect into firewalls that you don't have to manage anymore. And that's really the key part of this is because that when you're thinking about how you're going to support all the firewalls and all the locations that you have offices or users, that it really becomes impractical to start managing all of those firewalls on a one-on-one -on -one basis when you start thinking about that kind of scale where you don't really have technical people in a lot of those offices or you don't have technical resources to manage a gateway in countries where your users are traveling. So... Global Protect Cloud Service, what I'll be walking through in this presentation today, this morning, is what Global Protect Cloud Service is good for, some of the alternatives to some of the things that had existed in the past, and looking at the trade-offs that come between using a lot of the technologies that had we've seen up till now, and why Global Protect Cloud Service is really kind of different when you start to look at it very closely. During the second part of what we'll be doing is that in the Elysium conference, directly after this session, we'll be going through more of the details about what we do for specific use cases on threat prevention, being able to take a look at it more in depth about what we're doing with uh, the best practices for those that have already been using Global Protect. It'll give you more of the details about the actual configuration itself. Now, to get started, what I'm going to talk about first is that I'd like to kind of walk through the scenarios that we were looking at when we were going through and designing Global Protect in the first place. The first part of this is that we had been protecting corporate networks, of course, with a perimeter firewall, and that's great for protecting a network that you already control. The problem is, is that you really have a lot of applications and a lot of users that are going to be locations that are outside of that perimeter firewall. And when you think about that scope of things, that there's going to be an increasing number of users and applications and offices that are in locations outside of the network that you control. The secondary part about this problem is that when you look at this even further, is that a lot of these users and these offices are actually accessing applications that are hosted in the cloud. So there's really not a lot of reason from a networking perspective to start bringing that traffic back to where that firewall is located. So from that perspective, really the frustration between the networking team trying to find a shortest network path to an application is conflicting with what the security team knows is the best practice, which is to make sure that traffic is being protected by a firewall. The question becomes is that where do you put that firewall and how do you deploy it? How do you manage it? And that's really kind of the critical question that starts to come into play. Now, when we start thinking about what has been happening is that when we look at this spectrum a little bit further, is that a lot of times when you start to expand this problem out and you start talking to the people that are in the networking space, you start seeing that there's a little bit of tension saying that, you know what, the networking team thinks it might be a good idea to just do a breakout of that traffic from that branch location to the public cloud or to the directly to the internet. And then that frustration starts to appear and manifest in ways where the networking team is trying to figure out what type of security solutions now can be backed into that problem. You now have a breakout that's being secured in a different manner than the way that you would if you had that stuff going through a corporate firewall. So trying to bring this all into some reconciliation where we're getting consistent networking, consistent Net security policy enforcement and doing all of this in a way where we can do the same protections off-prem as if the user was on-prem is complicated by the fact that we really don't have the applications in the network of control. We don't have users in the network we control. And what do we do about it? So 
when you look at this framework like this, we start to start to discern that there are certain technologies out there that are being used to address part of this problem space. And what I'll be doing for the next few minutes is that we'll be walking through each one of these boxes to take a look at when do you use things such as bringing that traffic back to corporate? What do you use remote access VPN for? What do you use when you're using proxying out to the internet? And then some of the other alternative solutions out there such as DNS filtering and CASB and what are those really good for? Now, the first one up there is the MPLS connection because that the MPLS connection in IPsec is the traditional way that you build wide area networks, right? Most organizations that have a branch office have at some time or continue to do MPLS connections back to the corporate environment. So when you look at it from this standpoint, really what you have is that all the traffic from the branch office goes over the MPLS circuit so that you have all that traffic going to corporate but the problem here is that when you do this is that one, it used to make sense to do this because that one, you wanted to make sure that all the traffic was going to some application that was most likely being hosted in an internal data center. It also made sense because that's where the firewall was located, right? You might not necessarily deploy the full stack of security at that branch office. So it made no sense to break out the traffic from that branch office at that time because like if you went directly to the internet and you're using some commercial or consumer grade firewall, you're really not getting any protection at all. You might be able to protect the inbound connection, but you won't be able to secure the outbound connection. So going back to where your firewall is located before you break out to the internet is actually a good thing from a security perspective. So all this when you're using MPLS, MPLS is actually great for certain ideas, meaning that you do have a reliable connection, you have low latency, and you have one central firewall that all traffic is routed through. All the things that you would expect in the wide area network over MPLS connections are great, except for the idea about all the things that are now organizations are now suffering from when you look at the idea that cloud makes it less practical to bring that traffic back to corporate in the first place. What happens is that if you send that traffic from the branch office to corporate and then it goes out to the internet to go to your cloud application, then that traffic returns back to that firewall and then goes back to the branch office, the latency that's being added by hopping over to corporate to get to the internet is going to make the user experience suffer. And when you think about that, this link when you're talking about MPLS is not typically that fast in the first place. It's, it's designed for low latency and reliability, but not necessarily speed. There's much faster internet connections that you can get from um, any broadband provider nowadays that would go directly to the internet. But the goal of getting to that firewall was good. The cost of using the MPLS is not so good. And as the offices get further and further out, that cost and the latency start to increase. The other problems start to occur is that as you look at how MPLS had been deployed in the past, that really MPLS gets a little frustrating when you start talking about global deployments because that essentially you don't have carriers that have 100% coverage of the world. You have best effort to cover as many countries as you can. You need to get that, uh, make sure that the MPLS link is available in the places that you have offices, but that's not always the case. And really dealing with the equipment portion of it has been somewhat frustrating. So, a lot of these reasons have been driving organizations to consider alternatives. And when you look at the first alternative that people had been approaching was the idea of using site-to-site -site VPN tunnels over the internet to do that. So site-to-site -site VPN does take advantage of the internet. It does provide security in terms of getting out to replace that link for the wide area network. The things that start to come into play here is though is that we're still not solving that problem about where the security goes. You do still need to get to a corporate firewall in order to go out to the internet safely. So even if you do set up this environment over multiple uh, uh, M IPsec connections from office to office, you still need to get to that corporate firewall to do that. So this, when you're talking about the site-to-site -site VPN, it does work very well from the, the, the standpoint of uh, opposed to using just the regular internet, you use IPsec tunnels over that broadband connection. 
people know how to do this. It's easy to configure in terms of getting that IPsec connection going. What's not really so great is just setting up all the tunnels as your organization starts to expand. And that's because that if you think what happens when you start to add another site. When you add another site, then you need to start building the IPsec tunnels to all the sites that you have connected to it. So it's not just one tunnel that you would bring up, but multiple tunnels that you need to bring up. And then it adds really a lot of complexity because that now you're starting to deal with a lot of frustration about how you would set up these branch offices and whether it makes sense to set them up in, that, in the first place like this. Because that when you think about it, a lot of times when you're talking about site-to-site -site connections with the branch office, there's not a tremendous number of applications that use site-to-site -site from branch to branch, but there are some. In particular, in particular, with the rise of VoIP, that becomes one of the most critical ones. And thus, the low latency requirements for VoIP start to make it so that you do want to make sure that there's a site-to-site -site tunnel. You don't want to make multiple hops to get to another branch. But with this problem of having to set up all this infrastructure, all this IPsec tunnel overlays makes it so that it's not really a fun thing to do uh, in terms of administration over long periods of times. So the next way that people have been approaching this is to say, you know what, I'm going to use MPLS, but I'm going to overlay that with my IPsec infrastructure. And this is sort of the best of both worlds and the worst of both worlds, and meaning that it does take advantage of having, to, uh, having the ability to use both the reliability of MPLS with the IPsec tunnels. And it can be used to prioritize to make sure that you do use the right tunnel for the right, or the right path for the right connections. But what is not really so great is that we really have a lot more trouble when you start to think about how you now have to still have to make sure there's the MPLS circuit at every location. You do offload some of that MPLS traffic to the internet so that you're not having to pour everything over the MPLS connection. So you do get more flexibility in terms of how you have bandwidth. What you do lose, though, is how to set up you know, really the, all the things that were going on with routing and all that. How do you prioritize all this? And that's kind of like where the whole space where SD-WAN is starting to take off, where it is much better at being able to do this than having to manually build this infrastructure for your own WAN. I'll talk more about MPLS in a minute. But as we start to progress and start to take a look at that's how we were dealing with offices, let's talk about the user space. Now, when you have users that are off-prem, the traditional way to get users back to some type of protection is to use a VPN tunnel, right? Most VPNs are set up primarily for one thing only, and that is remote access. I distinguish remote access from what other types of VPN connections because that remote access is really primarily set up so that you connect to the VPN you connect to the VPN gateway where the tunnel terminates, and that's where your application happens to be hosted, right? You would be hopping to the VPN gateway that would get to you to the data center, and you access that application at the data center, and in most cases, the user would just disconnect at that point. So when you think about what VPN, remote access VPN does, is that it provides a temporary connection to the corporate environment, and a temporary connection behind a corporate firewall, because that if you were happen to be using corporate applications out to the internet at that point, you would be protected by the, the, the firewall in order to do that. What remote access VPN is not really so great at is that when you think about this, any type of VPN gateway, and a VPN concentrator is not a firewall. A VPN concentrator only terminates a tunnel. If you were to do anything with that traffic to go to the internet at that point, if it's not going through a firewall, it's not secure. So what VPN tunnels really have to do is that it's not how long that connection is. It is, does it get to you a firewall is the main question. Because if it doesn't get to you a firewall, you still need to route to a firewall before you can go to the internet safely. And that's when, when you look at a lot of remote access infrastructures, if they've been traditional VPN providers, they're really designed to just shorten the VPN tunnel connection, but you still need to haul that traffic back to corporate 
So it's not really solving the problem about what to do about cloud applications because users still don't want to be connected if they don't have to be. They don't want to be connected because even if they might have a short gateway path to, let's say that you're in Europe and you're connecting to another site in Europe, you're still being routed to some other location where the firewall is located. You really want to make that tunnel short and the firewall optimally located in the right location. And that would be the correct way to implement VPN if it was done right, but VPN as a remote access tool is not really the right way to do that. It's really to connect and then disconnect rather than stay connected at all times. Now, when you're not connected, a lot of organizations have been going through the process of saying, okay, you're connected with the VPN and then you're disconnected at some times and when you're disconnected, what do you do? And that disconnected space it's typically been solved with a taking a traffic, some traffic, through a proxy or a secure web gateway. Uh, proxies and secure web gateways are essentially equivalent. But the whole concept here is that when you think about this, that the standpoint that you have a branch office that would be going through a corporate, or it could be a remote user for, for that matter, that traffic would be secured if it was going over the corporate link. But then you have internet breakout where it's passing through the cloud proxy in order to get some type of protection. And I use the word some type of protection very specifically because that some protection is exactly what it is. It's not as secure as bringing that traffic through a firewall. Because whenever you're using a proxy, a proxy is essentially taking that traffic to the proxy server. The proxy server is doing the actual request to HTTP, uh, HTTP get back to the site that you're trying to access, and then doing the filtering before it gets back to that user. Now, what happens if it's not HTTP? It depends on the proxy vendor to implement some type of workaround on what to do with the, all the non-HTTP traffic. So in many cases, it's HTTP only in many cases. And the other scenario is that it's HTTP in that direction or, and everything else goes off to, to the corporate MPLS lane. So now we have a lot of problems because that when you think about it from that standpoint that you know, proxies are pretty good at breaking applications as well. Essentially, when you think about how all the different ways that traffic can pass through and all the rewriting that occurs through it, that it's not the same as just running that traffic through a firewall if the firewall was available at that point. So the other things that have been happening in this space is that to address that problem, We've been seeing a lot of vendors offer what's things that are just essentially DNS filtering solutions. And then when you look at it from this space, DNS filtering is again dealing with the problem of VPN connected is secured, VPN disconnected is unsecure. So DNS filtering makes it so that you change your DNS uh, so that when you're going to the internet, you would use uh, the security provider's DNS server where it is capable of saying, you know what, this site is hosting something bad. I'm not going to allow you to connect to it by not resolving the DNS request. So DNS request is pretty cool from the idea that it doesn't require anything to install other than you configure the endpoint. And it is something that it doesn't, um, you don't need to have a VPN connection all the time. What's not really so obvious about DNS filtering is that when you only protect at the DNS layer, you're only really securing known bad. Because that if that site happened to be hosting something that is bad, you, not, you won't resolve that, the, the, uh, the DNS request, so you don't get to it. But what happens like when you have sites where it's a good application, but it's hosting malicious content, like Box might have a piece of malware in it. You can't block Box and continue to hope to keep operating like that. You have to really look at the content itself. And DNS filtering actually doesn't look at the content. It's only saying it sees something, a site that's known to be bad and doesn't resolve it. The other problem with this is that you can always stand up one more site, right? So if you're thinking about the customized attack where the attacker is very specifically building infrastructure to trick their users to a phishing site, and that phishing site's never appeared before, there's nothing that DNS filtering is going to do to inspect it because that it's simply never going to have known that site was bad in the first place. Nobody has seen it, so it's never been registered to be known to be bad. 
And then probably when you start to look at that one step further that, you know, DNS filtering is, is so if you're only looking at known bad and you can always make new unknowns, then really how much protection are you getting? It's just a limited amount of protection. Uh, really, again, it's better than nothing. It's lightweight but it's not really solving the security problem. It's really only making it feel like that you're doing something. And in fact, most of the times that DNS filtering is primarily good for compliance because that you wanna say that we blocked users from you know, say adult sites or something like that. Fantastic use of DNS filtering, but stopping known bad, um, questionable, unknown bad, it can't do that at all. So, the other model that we see is that when you're talking about SAS, and SAS has been typically using a proxy, it's not usually called a proxy, but all CASBs use some type of proxy to take the traffic through some type of inline security. So when you're hopping through that proxy, that you would get some type of protection as you go into the SAS application, because you can't install a firewall, obviously, in the SAS application itself. But this infrastructure basically makes it so that you do get parity between the corporate and the off-prem user going through a CASB. But the idea here is that that, inline, that that proxy does provide inline protections. And a lot of organizations have been trying to basically ramp up the protections in there. Like you see a lot of CASB vendors mention that they have some type of advanced protections on there. But it's really only looking at the HTTP traffic as it goes to a SaaS application, and in most cases, just looking at the malware that may be hosted in that, some type of data filtering and something like that sort. But anything that is not going through the SaaS application would be going through all the non-HTTP going directly to the internet. So again, what we're talking about here is that this device gets popped, it gets compromised, and it's running around with no way to identify that it's being doing something bad stuff because that we're not bringing it through a common infrastructure. So when we look at it this from this standpoint, that really the way we approach Global Protect Cloud Service is that we wanted to build a common framework to deliver the platform to address all these scenarios. And what Global Protect Cloud Service really is, is that instead of having to manage the firewalls yourself, we'll stand up the firewalls for you. And what we do here is that when we set up the firewalls in this manner, it's the whole delivery of the firewall, the whole configuration of the firewall is taken care of for you because that we're delivering it through our infrastructure. You don't have to go out and find a coloc to put a hardware firewall. You don't have to think about what size you have to put a firewall you need in that location. You don't have to worry about the capex of buying a firewall in order to host it. You just simply load the firewalls up in the configuration and through Panorama to make sure to, to tell it where it goes. Now, the way that this works is that all the users and all the branch offices take a hop into Global Protect Cloud Service, and from there, they get all the protections as if there was a firewall on-prem. So thinking about this way, that you can take an office that has a basic router, any type of office that has uh, an existing firewall, Maybe that you've done an acquisition and then you've had uh, two sets of infrastructure, one using Palo Alto Networks and the other using some other vendor's firewall. The question that often comes up is that how do you start getting some standardization about security policy in all those places that aren't using Palo Alto Networks firewalls? So what you would do in this scenario is that you can take the Globe Protect, the, you can take that site that's using someone, others, someone else's firewall and build the tunnel into Global Protect Cloud Service, and Global Protect Cloud Service would enforce the policies as if that was an on-prem firewall. So that's the way that you don't have to put Palo Alto Networks firewall in every location that you have sites. And a lot of organizations, you can do this for many reasons. One is that you maybe you don't have technical staff there, and you don't want to necessarily manage firewalls. So a lot of organizations are looking to reduce the IT footprint, so they're not trying to put a lot of boxes in all those offices. A lot of organizations are thinking about this from the standpoint that, you know, if you have all the disaster recovery scenarios, like how do you deal with on-site spares and if you can't get it into those locations? Because like, like you might not having a, might not have a depot to ship a box there, or you don't want to keep another box on that 
uh, on that site for every single place that you have a retail office or, or retail or branch office. So Global Tech Cloud Service solves this by making it so that you just connect to the cloud service. You pick the location about where the firewalls go and you connect to the cloud service and that would take care of where security policy is happening. The other thing that's happening is that we build the networking so that you don't have to think about how to route the traffic to branch to branch, branch to headquarters, user to branch, user to headquarters, branch to internet, users to internet. All of those cases are covered by the Globe Tech Cloud Service because that with that full tunnel to Globe Tech Cloud Service that we route the traffic through our environment to the other locations. So instead of having to think about this from doing site to site VPN from one location to another, what you do is simply hop into Global Tech Cloud Service and it takes care of the routing to the other sites that you're trying to reach. The other things that are happening with Global Tech Cloud Service when it's not so obvious is that you basically can set this infrastructure up and it's available in minutes. If I was to go to Panorama and say that I need a firewall in, let's say, Europe, I could just go to Global Tech Cloud Service. I can configure it, push it out with a template and device stack, or a template and device and through Panorama, and have it so that that device, or the, pardon me, that cloud-based firewall is now ready to go. Now I can build a tunnel there, and I'm ready to connect. Compare that to the process of having to take a firewall, a physical firewall, and ship one, deliver it to your lab, configure it, ship it to the other location. Might be a country where you, it's not easy to import hardware, so you have to go through the import you know, laws about m moving equipment from a location to location. That process of doing it in hardware can take weeks, months, whereas like Global Tech Cloud Service, you can save a lot of time because that you can do everything through the cloud and you make one hop to the cloud to take care of the protection that you need. So digging in and looking at Global Tech Cloud Service, what happens here is that instead of having to do all the different scenarios that we covered with users on-prem, users off-prem, you can now just use Global Tech Cloud Service as the central way to bring the, all the things that you associate with the platform. So Global Tech Cloud Service includes threat prevention, UR filtering, wildfire, and of course, Global Protect. You have the option of using autofocus and aperture if you would like. And all of that is done by just, if you want to use Global Tech Cloud Service, then what you license is actually not the individual products, but if you're talking about branch offices, the aggregate amount of bandwidth that you're using. So let's say you have an office of 100 megabit, 100 megabit, 100 megabit. You would license 300 megabit through Global Tech Cloud Service and then assign that 300 as you would see fit. You have the choices of assigning it from 300, 100. Uh, normally I go the other direction, so let me do it the right, correct way. 2, 5, 25, 50, 100, or 300 megabit. And when you do that, what's not so obvious is that it's not dependent on the features you use. So let's say that you're thinking about using SSL decryption. Most of the times when people are thinking about SSL decryption, SSL decryption gets a little frustrating because you're starting to say, hey, SSL decryption uses a lot of hardware uh, firepower so that maybe I don't necessarily have enough you know, uh, computing power on my box. I may need to upgrade my box. With Global Tech Cloud Service, that goes away. The reason being is because that if you're licensed to use 100 megabit at the office, it doesn't matter if you're using SSL decrypt or not. You'll still get 100 megabit. So you basically can use any features you want, including the newest features, because that as new operating, uh, new PanOS releases come out, We'll take care of the process of upgrading them to the latest current version, and that way you can just use the features that you'd like rather than having to think about upgrading boxes and all the, the normal things that would come with a physical box upgrade. The other part that we're looking at is that if you were to dig deeper into the hood about what Global Protect Cloud Service is doing, you can see that this is actually configured as a full mesh VPN, and let me kind of walk through what you're seeing here. 
offices are connected to a cloud-based firewall. So all these offices are connected to the cloud-based firewall. And all those cloud-based firewalls that are marked FW are connected in full mesh. Now, there's also a service connection. Service connections are the ways that you actually connect back to headquarters. So getting to headquarters means routing from o via OSPF from the firewall to the service connection and the service connection to headquarters. You can have up to three service connections. And those service connections don't use any of the bandwidth in that pool that I was mentioning earlier. It is purely about making sure that you can bring that traffic from the branch to headquarters or headquarters to the branch. And um, it's only used for those specific cases because that the headquarters is not allowed to send traffic to the internet over that service connection. You'll have to use your current internet connection to do that because that, it's being protected by the firewall itself. The bandwidth pools are used only for those branch offices, but it's not the users in this case, the users are licensed by user. So let's say that you don't have any branch offices. You just have a bunch of uh, users that are traveling from locations outside of your office. You take your users through a Global Protect gateway, and we set up those Global Protect gateways in all the sites that we have around the world, so that when users get internet connectivity, they would automatically connect to one of those gateways. And the user doesn't have to figure out which one it is. The user would get internet connectivity. They, once they're connected to the internet, it would connect to a Global Protect portal that we manage for you. It's not one of your boxes like your traditional Global Protect deployment. It goes to the firewall, uh, to essentially a fully qualified domain name for a portal that's hosted in the cloud. And it tells you where all the firewalls are located. And the Global Protect app that's installed on the user's endpoint or mobile device would automatically connect to one of those gateways, marked the GP on this diagram. So all of these technologies that we've been talking about have been workarounds to address this problem space. And with Global Protect Cloud Service, we are basically eliminating the need to do all of these things separately. Because with the common framework that we can do all these things in Global Protect Cloud Service, what I want to talk about now is maybe if I could spend a few minutes to talk about the, the ability about what you do with SD-WAN. Because SD-WAN adds some complications that are, again, there's some trade-offs, some good and bad in each one of the SD-WAN infrastructures that are out there today. And I wanted to make sure that you kind of understand the SD-WAN landscape so that you can ask the really smart questions about how to secure SD-WAN. It's not obvious because that a lot of the SD-WAN vendors are a little bit different in, in one way or another. So, when you think about this from this concept of SD-WAN, let, kind of, let me kind of step through this. The first type of SD-WAN infrastructure is taking an SD-WAN vendor and using their own firewall functions. So if there's like VeloCloud or uh, CloudGenX or any of the other vendors that are out there, they all have their SD-WAN edge device. They, some of them have SD-WAN gateways. Some of them have, have points of presence. And depending on how that they've implemented the security, typically a stateful inspection firewall, some offer more than that, some do more inspection than that. But the traffic would be going through the SD-WAN fabric and then out to the internet or over the SD-WAN fabric to the other sites that you're reaching. And that basic level of security is pretty common across all the SD-WAN vendors. The problem, though, is that when you think about this from the standpoint of user going to the internet, that or the SD-WAN edge device going to the internet, stateful inspection firewall is not really the same as doing full inspection because that SD uh, stateful inspection is fine for inbound connections, but not really looking at the content for an outbound connection. Being able to supplement SD-WAN with additional security measures requires looking at other ways to bring firewall capabilities back to the SD-WAN infrastructure. The, one of the ways that some of the vendors out there are doing it is to take firewall products and add SD-WAN capabilities to it. And that's because that 
if you look at it, a lot of vendors that are doing in this space make it look like that they are doing SD-WAN. They're taking some version variant of policy-based forwarding, but it's not really true SD-WAN. It is really some, a lot of cases, it's just a renamed feature that the firewall is already doing, but it's not really the SD-WAN that you would normally associate that if you went to a pure play SD-WAN vendor. The distinction, though, is that it might be better at firewall than a standalone SD-WAN vendor is, but it's not great at doing SD-WAN itself. So really what you're trying to do is that you want good SD-WAN and you want good firewall capabilities, and that space requires integrating the two technologies. That's where there's some confusion going on because the approach that you take to do that can be quite complicated because that there's some vendors that basically approach this from the standpoint that I'm going to take SD-WAN traffic, I'm going to the SD-WAN fabric, and as long as I'm going to something that is internal, I'm not going to inspect is one of the assumptions that's often made. The SD-WAN vendor in this case is primarily thinking about, normally thinking about maybe only internet traffic is the untrusted zone, and only that internet traffic is what I need to inspect. So if you talk to many SD-WAN vendors that say, maybe they want to go one hop through a secure web gateway to block bad internet sites, for example, that's where you see a lot of SD-WAN vendors offering basically a simplistic version of security. Again, it's probably better than nothing. It's better than just using a stateful inspection firewall because you're getting some content inspection capabilities. What you don't get, though, is that the SD-WAN fabric itself is not secured because that the traffic that's within the SD-WAN fabric is never being inspected because that it's not going through the internet gateway, the secure web gateway. It's only the traffic that is egressing out to the internet that was going through any type of content inspection. So when you're thinking about what you're getting from visibility or logging for internal traffic, let's say that maybe a device that's in the branch got popped and that device is running around infected, it's still going to be able to conduct lateral movement within the enterprise because that there's no inspection from the traffic from the secure web gateway. It's not egressing to the internet at that point. That lateral movement as it's happening inside the organization is happening because that there's no segmentation, there's no inspection, there's no visibility about what's happening. That's the problem with the secure web gateway proxy environment with SD-WAM. The other approach is to actually put a firewall next to the SD-WAN edge device. And there's a couple of problems, good and bad. If you're talking about SD-WAN from the standpoint of traditional, you may have three or four users in that office, I don't really want to stand up a bunch of hardware. In those cases, putting a firewall there is still probably the best in terms of security but it may be an uh, onerous solution if you're thinking about it, I didn't want to put another box there in the first place. This problem starts to manifest because that, you know, a lot of organizations have different security goals at the branch. If you're thinking about it from the standpoint that I have three or four users at that branch location, putting a hardware firewall at that location probably is not going to be very practical, pragmatic. It's not going to be something that you want to do. You do probably want some alternative, and that alternative, which I'll talk about in a second, is to go through Global Protect Cloud Service. But the other way of doing this is that you could use a firewall, a virtualized firewall, as a VNF, a virtualized network firewall, inside the SD-WAN Edge device. So we've gone, started to go down this process. If you've been looking at what we're doing with Fellow Cloud, for example, you could take a VM series and put the VN series as a VNF inside the VeloCloud device. And with the integration that you can now have the ability to do things like communicate with the Panorama license server and make it so that you can really have the capabilities of doing a full firewall at that as an egress point without having to, so if you're doing a split tunnel from that branch location, it would go through the VM series, getting all the protections without having to use any other the cloud service. Basically, it's good, I, good from the standpoint of not having to deploy multiple boxes, but if you still want to do, do things like zero trust or network segmentation, or your office is big enough where you really want, to, you really want full control of the box, then that solution really does going to depend on having a physical box on-premise rather than using 
the VNF option inside the SD-WAN edge device. Because that really, you do need access to the interfaces in order to get insertion into the network and all the other things that we'd normally be doing with network segmentation. SD-WAN with Global Protect Cloud Service works a little bit differently. And from this standpoint, what SD-WAN with Global Protect Cloud Service will do is that with Global Protect Cloud Service, the firewall is in the cloud service, not on-prem. The SD-WAN edge device hops into Global Protect Cloud Service in order to secure the traffic. So you have the IPsec tunnel coming from the SD-WAN edge device into Global Protect Cloud Service, but this is actually not as straightforward as it seems because there's a lot of SD-WAN vendors out there that do different things. Walking through this, the first one is that there are some vendors that basically use a POP infrastructure for SD-WAN. And that POP infrastructure for SD-WAN makes it so that the SD-WAN edge device would normally hop into the POP, and that POP would be the way that it would take the traffic to the other branches or back to corporate. If you do it this way, this is something that's not really that bad of an idea from the standpoint of making it, making it easy to deploy. What happens is that if you're taking that traffic to the POP and that would take it to the other locations, it is okay in terms of, uh, from some perspectives and not okay in, some, in others. The, the good part is that you do get protection to the internet. The bad part is that you're not getting inspection of branch to branch. And the reason being is because that if you're going for the branch office to the SD-WAN fabric, back to the branch office, it's never going through a firewall. It's not going through, the firewall would be Global Tech Cloud Service in that scenario. So that's what a, some of the trade-offs that happen in that. If it was actually a branch going to corporate, you would have security in that sense because that there's going to be that firewall located there at corporate. It's the branch to branch scenario that is the thing that you need to look for in the SD-WAN POP architecture. The other thing that you probably want to look at is that when you do it from this standpoint, you onboard every site, every branch office into Global Protect Cloud Service. May not be a problem. In fact, it's probably the best way to do that if you have maybe, if you say you have five, 10, 100 branch offices, you're just going to onboard each one of those connections into Global Protect Cloud Service. And probably the easiest way to do that at scale. The thing that it happens though is that if maybe you don't want to manage that many connections into Global Protect Cloud Service or in the other approach that you see in SD-WAN is that there are vendors that use an SD-WAN gateway. And in this model, the SD-WAN gateway is onboarded into Global Protect Cloud Service. So there's one connection that goes into Global Protect Cloud Service rather than one from every site. The good part about that is that only one connection to manage. The bad part is that all the traffic from all the branches have to go into that link. And if you're going to have multiple links, you're going to, if you need more than 300 megabit, you're going to have to use multiple links into Global Protect Cloud Service to do that. The other part to think about here is that how you actually get the protection comes into play because that Again, the problem of what to do about branch to branch or branch to corporate comes into play. What happens here is that, sorry. What happens here is that you may want to be thinking about this in terms of a service chain. What would happen here is that the SD-WAN gateway can be set up to service chain another service so that all traffic egressing would be going through the Global Tech Cloud Service regardless of where it's going to be routed to. It's not just internet traffic, which is the way that the previous diagram worked, but even if you're going to the branch office, you would chain through Global Tech Cloud Service to get the inspection and the visibility to that branch. So being able to kind of summarize what Global Tech Cloud Service is really all about, Global Tech Cloud Service, all the things that you saw, is about how to reduce the friction that it comes from deploying the infrastructure yourself. Really what we're doing here is that we're setting up the firewalls on your behalf, loading it with your security policies, 
But we manage the firewalls and orchestrate where the firewalls go. You just have to pick what locations they go to, or in the case of remote offices, or in the case of mobile users, we'll set those firewalls up globally. It reduces the operational expenses, or at least makes it predictable, because that when you manage a physical firewall, you don't really maybe not be able to predict how much you're going to be spending in terms of operational expense. And you're probably going to be spending significantly more in CapEx too, because that when you buy a physical firewall, you're really buying the capacity over the lifetime of the device. You buy it over, let's say if you have the device for five years, you're buying for the capacity you need in that fifth year, even though that you may be only using a fraction of it in year one. So all that wasted capacity is expense that we really didn't need to be spending in the first place. Translating that into Global Tech Cloud Service, you just use what you're going to need for that year and expand as you, your needs grow. And if your needs grow even further beyond that, you can switch from cloud service to hardware or hardware to cloud service. Either way, it makes it so that you use what you need rather than spending on a capacity you didn't. Makes security consistent. So all the things that we're doing, all the connections for remote offices, all the branch offices, and all the users are going through the same security policies as if the user was on-prem. And this is really just a more efficient way of doing firewall deployment than having to put the physical boxes in each of those locations. So Global Tech Cloud Service is really using all the things that we do in the platform. So all the things that you've been seeing with, we're talking about application framework, layering into logging service. Global Tech Cloud Service puts traffic uh, logs into the logging, frame, logging service so that you can take advantage of all the other things that are happening in application framework. So all the things that you associate with where Palo Alto Networks is doing our innovation in the future is through the application framework and Global Tech Cloud Service is a great first step towards getting there. With that, I know I got maybe just a couple minutes left, but uh, if there's any questions in the room, I'm happy to answer them. You're doing a comparison between um, uh, other SD1 vendors and uh, <coughs> tech, uh, cloud service systems. Um, other, uh, uh, other vendors with uh, SD1 and cloud systems also do a link uh, optimization. So you have the MPL there. Yeah, that's a question that comes up from time to time that what do you do? Like, it looks like Global Protect Cloud Service can handle some of these use cases that SD WAN does. Our, our goal right now is to partner rather than build our own SD WAN capabilities. So, when you see what our partnerships, we've done the partnerships with, I think, eight, nine of the SD WAN vendors that are out there. With that said, though, there are probably some use cases where using Global Protect Cloud Service as the first hop actually probably alleviates or replaces the need to use MPLS on your own, and maybe you don't need SD-WAN in that scenario. I'm not going to say that that's always the best option because that we're not taking advantage of the multiple links like, you're, like you mentioned, and it's not really a true SD-WAN capability. But I, I think that there's probably a spectrum of solutions. People that are moving off of MPLS can use Global Protect Cloud Service in some cases. But if you're using multiple links or if you want to do some of the policy forwarding through specific applications, you really want true SD-WAN, and that's why we did the partnerships that way. But we're not bringing those capabilities. We're not working on them right now to put them in PanOS. So that's, that's really the goal is to partner. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is like, how do you, how, how do we, let's say, optimize for the, the traffic that's going to different applications? Well, right now, what we did is very intentionally, we built this in public cloud infrastructure rather than building it in specific POPs with some, some POPs, some of the vendors out there that use the POPs that are using, you know, some type of fast path to the, uh, the cloud-based applications. Our first goal was to make sure that we can use public cloud 
and being able to take advantage of this elasticity one is so that we can basically expand the capabilities that rather than having to use a, a pop infrastructure that's basically fixed and locked in with whatever hardware that we had to be had put in that place. So flexibility was that first goal. The idea that we may go down the path of adding faster connections than what we do through the public cloud. But I think that you'll probably see us first move to, you know, basically what we're running, do, what we're doing now is that we set up the environment in one of the public cloud providers and we'll expand that beyond that down the road. Maybe we'll look at it at how we can do multiple configurations so that you have faster paths to public cloud applications, but not necessarily like, I know where you're going, you're probably thinking about, can you use that Cololoke to go directly into O365 or something like that? But that's something a little bit further down the road. Uh, I'm sorry, one more time. Oh, the, the regions that have Global Protect right now, you can go to status.paloaltonetworks.com and you can see all the sites. So all that, just status.paloaltonetworks.com and it's not protected by um, any password. You can, use the, you, just any, you can use it with your phone right now and be able to check the sites. Okay, so we're going into our next session. The, the next session is gonna be do, how you do threat prevention through Global Protect Cloud Service. And that's going to be in Elysium, if you'd like to follow that. Uh, we're going to do a demo in the expo hall. That's, and I'll be around if, in case if you have any further questions. So with that, concludes today's sessions. Thank you very much.